Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On the evening of July, uh, July 14th, 2016, uh, you know, a white 19-ton truck drove up and down the promenade in, ne in Nice, killing people who were celebrating. Um, and it just kept running for almost two kilometers, killing men, women, children, families. Um, and it wasn't stopped until the police shot the man. So when 86 people died, 307 were injured, and nobody saw this coming. And then 10 days later, uh, <clears throat> a 27-year-old <clears throat> Syrian refugee, <clears throat> excuse me, blew himself up, you know, injuring 15 people in, uh, in, German, in a small German town. And again, nobody saw this coming. And two days after that, uh, knife wielding, uh, uh, two knife wielding men uh, broke into a church in Normandy and uh, held five people hostage and slit the throat, killing an 85 year old priest. And nobody saw this coming. This is what, this makes me sad, but it also makes me angry. Uh, and I'll tell you why it makes me sad later, but uh, we have, you have to look at the underlying problem with surveillance. And right now that problem is lack of focus. They're collecting the entire world. They're not focusing. Um, <clears throat> and after the attacks, of course, the intelligence agencies go in, and you see it reported on television that they, they come back and say, oh, yes, we, we knew who these people were. We had data on them. And yes, uh, you know, all of this was, uh, was known at the time. Uh, but they didn't do anything. The problem is not, not getting the data. The, the problem is they have the data. They've got too much data. Um, and they, they're having that, that much data causes them a problem being able to detect the threat in advance so they can take actions to stop the, stop the attacks. Th this was the problem, even in the analog days, this was the problem that I had uh, in working against the Soviet Union. There was an awful lot of data there, too. And so this was what my focus was over my entire career, was how can you boil down this massive amount of data to something that would be meaningful so that people could actually uh, do something positive and succeed at their jobs? So uh, that's why, uh, with Ed Loomis and a small team, we put together a a program that was able to do that in the digital age. Uh, we called it Thin Thread, and it, this is what the, the, the movie A Good American was all about, showed you how we developed this kind of program to be able to do that. A and the whole idea, again, was to prevent these terror attacks, but this is the part that makes me angry because uh, all of these attacks could have been stopped. These people didn't have to die. I mean, it's not just these attacks that I mentioned, but many, and many more, including 9-11, 7-7, uh, the Madrid bombings, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, Paris, Brussels, Orlando, virtually every attack that's occurred could have been stopped. They had the data to do it. Afterward, they told you uh, publicly they knew the people who did it. They were targets. We really only needed two things to, to make that possible to stop these attacks. One was a known target. And uh, then digital transactions to be able to select out of the flow of information things that were related to those targets and be able to monitor and watch them and follow them. Uh, <clears throat> we could have stopped uh, all of those attacks by doing this. And we wouldn't need to collect the content or all the other metadata of everybody on the planet to do it. Because the metadata is uniquely identifiable and you can see it, that's how we were able to do it with ThinThread, to be able to pick it out of the flow of data going by at fiber optic rates. And the truth really is in the metadata. I mean, content can be confusing from time to time. I mean, they can, it, can be, uh, it can be a collection of fabrications too, like we, we got, for example, uh, from content uh, fabrications about uh, Obamacare in the United States, all these promises that never came through, and I think in Britex, uh, you also had some occur, so that uh, that's content for you. But <laughs> the metadata around it would tell you there's still a relationship being built, and uh, it it wouldn't it wouldn't pr produce lies or manipulation or things like that by looking at con at the content. And you know, while uh, <clears throat> while uh, GCHQ continues to look at uh, porn videos or other kinds of information about individuals and their relationships with others uh, that have nothing to do with anything relevant to terrorism or any kind of criminal activity. Um, you know, other things are happening <clears throat> that aren't being watched, and that's why these attacks occur. Now we come to the part that really makes me angry. Um, 
The killers in Nice were known. Uh, they used electronic communications. That meant you could track them. They, they were uh, networked with radical Islamists, and they had a footprint showing sympathies towards these, these terrorist attacks, like, for example, the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre. And early on the day, this, this fellow drove his truck down that promenade illegally. He wasn't supposed to be there. But again, uh, not, nobody saw this coming. Uh, these were all of things that would have been automatically alerted by the Thin Threat program. I mean, we didn't depend on people to recognize things. That was the difference. Now, and they still do it today, they depend on people to recognize things. We did not. We wrote software to manage it, replace the people, make the alerts happen automatically to everybody that needed to know within milliseconds of the event. So the guy that blew himself up in, the, in, the, in Germany in a small town, he was known by the police also. And he also had, uh, known by social services, he was under psychiatric care. And he was in touch with the ISIS members. That's a red flag immediately. Uh, and he had a digital footprint uh, uh, full of Islamic ideas in, social, in the social network. And he, brought, uh, and he, and he bought materials uh, for bomb making. I mean, these should be a direct alerts. We have people talking about intent or threats, and that's the, that's the intention. And then you have him buying the bomb materials. That's capability. Intentions and capability, that's warning. I mean, this is not that hard. It all can be done with software. You don't need people to do it, especially when you're forcing them to look at massive amounts of data. Uh, but again, nobody saw this coming. And the guys who killed the, the, the priest in Normandy, they were both known also by the police. Both were caught in Turkey for trying to cross into Syria. Uh, one attacker landed in jail and had to be, when, and was released four, four months before the, the, their attack in uh, Germany. And, uh, that was opposed by the prosecutor, but they still let him out. And he was electronically tagged but, and, and under curfew. But that didn't seem to make too much difference. And both were in touch with the terrorist, in a ter terrorist network and a chat network, in a chat room. Uh, and French intelligence got a tip from uh, Turkish intelligence that, uh, about one of, the, one of the two guys uh, before the attack, four days before the attack, but nobody saw this coming. Now, 9-11 and Thin Thread and, and our program uh, would have uh, detected this material right up front and electronically alerted people without anyone required, any, it didn't require anybody to recognize it. The software did it. And that was the whole point of it. I mean, you, you do things that you know, you can, you can formalize and put in uh, logic and execute with code. That, made, that, made, that took that job away from people. They didn't have to do that. That was done, and it was done efficiently, consistently, and accurately. Uh, you ha don't have all those guarantees when people do it. Uh, you have to depend on their, their abilities, their skills, and so on, and that varies. Uh, and so we knew we were creating, um, as they try to explain in the movie, that we were creating the, what was called the knowledge bomb. This is where you are, are assembling uh, a crucial center for power over everyone on the planet, potentially. Uh, they have made it that way. Uh, because they're collecting everything. Mass data collection on everybody on the planet gives them power over everyone, over everybody in parliaments, everybody, every citizen of the world. If you do something they don't like, they have a way of stopping you. They'll find something and make that happen. So, uh, and the point is that uh, everybody's got uh, some dirt, you know, everybody's got a secret or something to hide something to fear, some, something to lose, or someone they care about that can be leveraged. So this, give, this is what gives them that power. This was the standard procedure of the KGB, also the Stasi and uh, the Gestapo. Uh, so this is, uh, what, uh, what we're really talking about here is that we, we can't depend on our governments to do the right thing. We have to stand up and start it ourselves. It's just not, I mean, there's too much vested power, when governments have power and it's vested in all of this knowledge, that, that's power that they don't want to give up. People are seduced by power just like they're seduced by money. So that means we the people who have more power than we think need to stand up and start opposing this and opposing the people who are advocating or continuing it. And uh, we have several ways we thought we could do that. One is to make sure you, that uh, they uh, start to institute certain things that, that would make it uh, auditable and followable so that they would know and the people would know what was happening 
that means that Parliament has to take a greater responsibility, actually fulfill their duty, and, and make sure that all the targeting is approved by them, not just a subset like in the U.S. where they have intelligence committees. They controlled knowledge and didn't tell the rest of Congress. They kept them uninformed. So they didn't know what they were voting on. So that has to change. And the governments, of course, and the agencies need to execute the tasking. That's fine. And each single act of, that, of targeting of individuals or, or categories of behavior need to be passed through the courts. The courts, a regular courts, not a secret court, not an ombudsman, but, but a, an open court that everybody can go into and challenge. If they're put on a list, they have to have a way and a mechanism to, to challenge that in a court, and that has to be built in. And there has to be a data search, like a data search of your house is a, is a, is a, uh, requires a warrant. So data search of your data or your metadata should require a warrant. It's an intrusion into your privacy. And all data needs to be protected and uh, violators need to be prosecuted. Start prosecuting these people, they will stop it. Uh, so this isn't a debate about technology, it's a debate about uh, principles. These, the, these are the underlying principles of, of human rights that we're talking about. These are the things we're debating and actually giving away. Now we're not opposing. That's why, I mean, uh, voters have more power than they realize. They've got all the power if they re recognize that and they can stand up and make this happen and make it change. This is why uh, we fought World War II, I mean, against the Nazis, against totalitarianism, and we won it. But if we create our own Gestapos, like we're continuing down that path now, we're going to lose this war 70 years after the fact. So our, our call to action is basically uh, saying things like, uh, yes, we want security, get rid of this um, nonsensical massive collection of data and give it to us. And we want privacy, stop this massive surveillance and give it to us. And we want to keep our freedoms because we have a right to it. That's our humanitarian rights. Thank you.